Good morning. Welcome to the San Francisco Interfaith Council online briefing for faith leaders. Today's program welcomes Speaker Nancy Pelosi to discuss federal COVID-19 relief efforts. This event is hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council and supported by the Joint Information Center of the San Francisco COVID Command Center. A bit of housekeeping as we begin. Audio, video, and chat will be monitored and recorded for record keeping, training, and quality assurance. By default, all participants will be muted and video turned off to minimize distractions. To submit a question or a comment, please select the chat button at the bottom of your screen and send a message to Q&A. Your questions and comments will be collected and forwarded to the speaker for response. A reminder that everyone living and working in San Francisco is eligible for a COVID-19 test. Please contact your healthcare provider to make an appointment or alternatively visit sf.gov forward slash get tested SF or simply call 311. And we recognize that ongoing stress from the pandemic, racial injustice, wildfires, and grief and loss are real. Maintaining our social connections during times of stress can be a lifesaver. If you could use help managing feelings like depression and anxiety, please reach out to the Mental Health Talk Line at 855-845-7415 or text the word HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741 to connect to a crisis counselor. Welcome once again, and it is my great pleasure to hand it over to the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas. Lynn, thank you so much. And thank you to our colleagues and our support staff over at the COVID Command Center's Joint Information uh, Center Virtual Outreach Team. Uh, you have been an invaluable asset and we are a great team together. So let's continue on. Good morning, I'm Michael Pappas and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I wanna welcome you to this morning's, um, out, morning's online briefing for faith leaders. At the very outset of the pandemic, Speaker Nancy Pelosi engaged San Francisco faith leaders in an important conference call. She offered her personal reflections on the impact of the pandemic, as well as reported on legislation that was being initiated in Congress to offer economic relief to those who had lost their jobs and were at risk of housing, healthcare, and food insecurity. That conference call initiated the format for the San Francisco Interfaith Council's weekly online briefings for faith leaders supported by the COVID Command Center's Joint Information Center virtual outreach team. We are extremely grateful to Speaker Pelosi for her leadership and for taking the time today to join us for this special briefing. At this time, it gives me great pleasure and it's a privilege to welcome the chairman of the board of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Koshi Kroy. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everyone. My name is Koshi, and on behalf of the council's board of directors, I do wanna extend a very warm welcome to all of you this morning. Uh, as it happens, tomorrow will mark seven months from the day Mayor Breed initially declared San Francisco's shelter in place. I don't think any one of us could have imagined uh, all that has come to be since March 16th of this year, but through it all, the council has held these weekly briefings for faith leaders. And as rich as the previous 26 community discussions have been, uh, we are certainly anticipating a very unique and unparalleled conversation with our guest speaker uh, this morning. I just wanna very quickly acknowledge the staff of the Interfaith Council, of which there are only two. Uh, one might find that surprising given the amount that they accomplish, uh, but Michael and Michael Pappas and Cynthia Zambukas have been extraordinary in embracing the unique role the council is playing right now in these times. And as I like to say, uh, there is no duo that you will find that can get more done uh, than Michael and Cynthia. So thank you to the, to the both of you. Uh, and then of course, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the board of the council wants to express our unending gratitude to you, uh, not only for finding the time in your schedule this morning to be with us, 
uh, but for being such a long time and dedicated supporter and partner to the council. Uh, so many of us here in the city of St. Francis and across the country and across the world, uh, I want you to know we will forever feel indebted to you because when it's time for the historians to write this dark chapter of our story, they will note that no one did more than you to try to keep the plague that is our White House from spreading any further than it had to. We pray for you. We always send you strength and peace of mind and good health. Thank you so much for being here. For those of you who are new to the council, at the beginning of every council meeting, there is an interfaith statement that we like to read to remind us all for the impetus that brings us together, and I will do that now. This is an interfaith community, whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Koshi, and thank you for your commitment and leadership and support. Uh, you have very much enhanced each one of these conversations, and we are grateful uh, for your leadership. At this time, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce a colleague, a friend, and a spiritual leader in San Francisco, the Right Reverend Dr. Mark Hanley Andrus, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of California. Thank you, Michael and Koshik. It's an honor to be with you. Speaker Pelosi, uh, I add my admiration and thanks to Koshik's expression for all of us gathered here and indeed all of San Francisco, California, the country and the world. None of that is too much to say. Health and economic recovery, Omnibus Emergency Solutions Act. That's a long name for an important act which uh, comes to the acronym HEROES Act. That was no accident on Speaker Pelosi's and the sponsor's part to name it the HEROES Act. Everyone facing what our governor is calling the twin demics is a hero and deserves all the support that can be brought to them. I want to lead a short meditation on heroes and courage. I recently held my first virtual memorial service. It was for an emergency room doctor who is in his early 70s. I have known him for many years and I didn't know that much of his deeper history. I heard from his family in preparing for the virtual memorial service that immediately after he had finished medical school at Creighton University, he was drafted his whole class into the Vietnam War. There he served as a doctor, but would not go on bombing runs because he believed it violated his Hippocratic Oath. He saved 32 people from drowning apart from his work as a physician in an emergency room physician. And he saved literally thousands of lives as a physician. At his memorial service, his family spoke. The last one to speak was his youngest daughter. She said that her eldest sibling, uh, her sister, got the hero gene because she too is a physician. Her brother, the middle child, got what she called the genius gene. And uh, on it went. And I thought about that. I thought, uh, indeed, this man was a hero. And I believe his daughter exemplifies hero heroism as well. But all of us are called and given the quality of courage in our lives. Courage is literally a word that means to act from the heart. And in my tradition, 
We believe that the love that strengthens the heart, that is sourced in the heart, is divine love. It comes from God. I call it overflowing love. But most of us have learned courage from a human being or from human beings. And at this moment, I ask you to center yourselves, to quiet your minds, and to call to mind the person who taught you courage. Who taught you courage in your life? Please say a word of gratitude prayerfully in your heart to the person who taught you to be courageous. And then know this, that person, if she or he has died, has not left you, has not left the good work that they did on the earth. They are still being courageous, still standing with you still standing with those who need help on the earth. Let us pray. O God of peace, who has taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be our strength. By the might of thy spirit, lift us, we pray thee, to thy presence where we may be still and know that thou art God. Through all that is holy, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Mark. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, it is a great joy and a privilege to have you among us. Uh, it's an ancient tradition of all religions to pray for our civic leaders and those who protect us. You make it very easy for us to pray for you. Uh, but at the same time, we are incredibly grateful for your leadership. Uh, and those of us who know you and know you well, know you to be a person of deep personal faith who expresses your faith in all that you do, both legislatively, but as a human being. We're grateful to have you with us today. I hand the floor over to you with much love and the 800 congregations and religious institutions in San Francisco stand with you. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It is not only my honor to be with all of you, but my personal uh, enrichment to be with you because I learn from you every time we come together. Uh, Bishop Mark, as always, thank you for your inspiring words. The courage does make the difference. We can all have our convictions and our commitment, but we don't have courage to follow through on it, uh, we have left something uh, lack. We have left something on the table. I just want to thank uh, Mike and Cynthia uh, for their wonderful leadership. Keisha Boy, thank you for your tremendous leadership in so many ways in our community. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your kind remarks this morning. And of course, we cannot talk the Interfaith Council without talking about Rita Semmel. Rita, I know you're out there someplace. Uh, Hello, darling. We're getting ready for your next birthday. And, and uh, again, uh, your life has been a blessing uh, to all of us uh, because you have brought us together as this Interfaith Council does. This is a situation where, uh, as I say to my own colleagues, our diversity is our strength and the beautiful diversity of all of the different faiths represented here. Our unity is our power unity, uh, organized, unified around the simple idea of the dignity and worth of every person and that there's a spark of divinity in every person. And that, as you've heard me say it many times, faith in the goodness of others gives us hope. So when people say, where is hope? It's right there between faith and charity, where it always has been and you all are such a manifestation of that. And again, our faith uh, uh, informs our public activity. In my case, being raised as a Catholic was 
simply inevitable that we would follow through on those principles of, of caring for each other and the rest into the public arena. So our focus today is on the heroes and I thank you Bishop Mark for uh, referencing that and, and, and uh, Kasich as well, Kasich as well. We passed the legislation based on science and on the needs of the American people and with the idea that they were worth it. People said, oh, it's too expensive. So we cut it back, not in values, but in timing. We had it going into well into next year because we thought the communities who are ministering to needs in terms of COVID would like to have that kind of certainty. But if they didn't wanna pay that price now, we have to pay it later, but nonetheless came down a trillion dollars. Then we came down $200 billion more. Then we absorbed hundreds of billions of dollars of more uh, needs because we had not addressed the, the crisis uh, so that there's no way we can go lower without hurting people. So that just gives you where, where we are in all this. Uh, yesterday was the most recent conversation I had with the secretary. I'll meet with him. I'll be talking to him later today as well. But here's the basic challenge that we face. And this, I can speak to you uh, clearly about this because some people just don't get it. But here's the thing. Uh, because there are basic needs that people need that we need to minister to, uh, the other side thinks that they could use that as leverage to get things that they want, to perpetuate uh, the disparities that we have in healthcare, that we have in education, that we have in uh, our economy. We can't let that happen. For example, for example, we call it heroes because we are heroes, our, our state and local workers, our, our um, healthcare workers, our teachers, our teachers, our teachers, our police and fire, our first responders, our transportation, sanitation, our food workers, they make our lives possible. Many of them have risked their lives, Father Mark just described, that beautiful doctor, risk their lives to save other people's lives, and now they may lose their lives, and now they may lose their jobs because the other side just says, we can't afford that. They're too busy giving tax cuts at the high end to say that we really respect and us. So you lose all authority to say to um, our heroes, let's applaud our heroes. No, let's pay them. Let's not make them lose their jobs and go on unemployment. That's how you honor them. We have no right uh, to say we honor them if we're not going to respect them and the job that they do for our community. So that's a sticking point. And yesterday, the secretary said, well, I'm not paying for any pensions. We're not talking about pensions. We're talking about coronavirus centric needs. But the city of San Francisco, and aren't we proud of Mayor Breach? He has done such a wonderful job. And, and Gavin Newsom, our, our, our governor as well, we couldn't be proud of their example to the rest of the country. But we, we couldn't, we, we couldn't they, what they provide for us, we couldn't do without these workers. Okay, so that's that. So the secretary said yesterday at some finance conference, I'm not paying for their pension. We're not asking you to pay for pension. We're talking about what the outlays were for coronavirus. You have to admit that the cities and states have made outlays of money. And also for the revenue lost because of the shelter in place, et cetera. They're more interested in doing the revenue loss than they are the outlays. But nonetheless, we want the money. We want that money. And so we cut it all the way back. They cut it all the way back further, but these people will lose their jobs. More than a million already have. Let me just throw on that for one sec. Ministering to needs of the people, all of the people in our community. The public role is a real role in the lives of people, whether it's education, transportation, well, sanitation, you know, we went through all that, healthcare and the rest. And many of those people are in communities that the president does not want to help. In our cities, in our states that he says are blue, so why should I help them? And many of them are people of color, both as the workers and the recipients of the service. Honor our heroes, first one pillar. The second pillar, crush the virus. 
crush the virus. What are we talking about? All of these consequences of the virus if we don't crush the virus and then get on with the future. But we have a difficulty with them accepting the language of a strategic national plan. They haven't done it yet. We've had it in the plan today marks five months since we passed the bill, five months. And what happened then? Mitch McConnell said, uh, let's take a pause. He forgot to tell the virus. It didn't take a pause. It's raging. He said, let the states go bankrupt. Oh, really? Oh, really? Let the states go bankrupt and therefore not minister to the needs of the people, okay? And I wish I had it right here to show you. In the debate he had uh, in a Senate race just the other day, when his challenger, Amy McGrath, was talking about, you've got to do something, you've got to come to, you've got to do something on the corner. You know what he said? Nothing. You know what he did? He laughed. He thinks this is a laughing matter. That's what we're dealing with, my friends. A leader in the Senate who laughs when you describe the needs of the people and why we have to act, the role of government and science in our lives. He laughed. You should see that. It, it breaks your heart. But it's indicative of the attitude of the administration and the Republicans. They have not taken this seriously. And what was really disappointing to me is with all of the arguments that we've made, all the case that we made, all the documentation of it, when they came back to answer our strategic plan, they cut out everything we had in there for communities of color, for communities of color, because that's really where this is having such a big impact, testing, tracing, treatment, mask wearing, separation, sanitation, has to go out to the communities of colors and our tribal, our tribes as well, same community of color, to amp that language. We know how hard it is to document all of that. So it's not as hard as passing a bill without it. Think of it that way. That's just one example. But it, the, if you don't understand why they do this, understand they have contempt for science and disdain for governance. So if science tells you you should wear a mask and there should be some guidance publicly to do so, that's two of their no-nos. We don't want any science and we don't want any public uh, requirement because we don't believe in science or government. So there you have that. Uh, uh, again, I'm not giving, believe it or not, I'm not, not telling the whole story. And then we come to, and so the injustice, the injustice of who gets services are met and injustice of who, um, jobs are lost, many uh, in the minority community. Okay, so then we go to the third pillar. One pillar, honor our heroes. Second pillar, crush the virus. We should have been doing, we had in our first bill, March 4th, testing, testing, testing. You know, I don't have to go into the, the hoax, the, the magic, the, the, okay. So now our third pillar, putting money in the pockets of the American people. And to do so in a way that respects work and respects those in the, shall we say, lower end of the economic place on the spectrum. So we put in uh, earned income tax credit, earned income tax, this is for the working poor, child tax credit, child and dependent tax credit, very, very important, stabilizing having this immediately, just directly helping people. They said, oh, I think there's some fraud there. Fraud? You're talking about fraud? And the president paid $750 in the year that he did pay taxes? You're saying that it's fraud there? So they said, well, we'll get back to you with a number. We had cut our number down because of timing, et cetera, but you could only go so far. And this is really directed to um, children, children and families of people working poor, okay? So they, um, they came back with their number, zero. At the same time, insisting that they have a net 
operating loss, multi-billion dollar tax break for the wealthiest families in America. They had that in the CARES Act. That was a price to pay to get the CARES Act. We're trying to get it out. And they're saying, well, zero for low-income families, net operating loss to the tune of $150 billion for the wealthiest people in our country. So when you see when we're having these fights and people say, why don't you take the deal? Take the deal to perpetuate disparity of income and healthcare and, and respect for the work that people do. There is no deal. First of all, there is no deal, it's an offer. The deal doesn't exist because they can't even pass it in the Senate because most of them don't want to do anything, okay? And so then we say, uh, again, we have big provisions for 17 million people in our country, food uh, children, food insecure. Millions of people on the verge of, um, of uh, um, eviction. And we have provisions in there to do that. So on eviction, they said, well, we don't know how that would work. Well, we'll tell you how it worked. Worked the same way that we put it in the uh, law, uh, 2008, 2009, to deal with people who were losing uh, um, uh, their housing at the time of the Great Recession. We already have that. We made it Corona-centric. So we're still waiting to hear for their, that they, you know, throw it here. We don't know how this will work. Some of those people should be paying rent anyway, and they're not, you know, that kind of disdain, distrust, really? And so, so Ken, so honor our heroes, crush the virus, money in the pockets of American people. Now we'll come to terms on how we do a direct payment and how we are still fighting over the amount for what we do on unemployment insurance. But you can't, we can't say to people, just so you should get what you're entitled to, they're gonna get all the rest of this and they're not going to crush the virus and they're gonna fire police, fire uh, teachers and all the rest and uh, uh, healthcare workers. I mean, it's, it's, we do not have shared values and I'm sorry to have to say that to you. So lives, livelihood, life of our democracy. This is heartbreaking. They don't want to do you know, election funding. Well, we'll give you 200 million dollars. We are asking for 3.6 billion dollars to make sure that people can vote and not risk their lives and their health by voting so that they can, and they can vote by mail and they don't try to undermine the postal system. I think we're going to see the language today that we're okay on the postal system to get some money there because every the outcry was so great. The um, they said they have no movement on elections, no movement on elections, and on the census they are doing severe damage to our country, severe damage to our country. This is every ten years, as you well know. It is important for us to have an accurate count of how many and who we are. And they try to shorten the distance between of when they could take um, the count from the end of October to the end of September. We won some victories there to push it to the end of October. And now the Supreme Court of the United States upheld the, the stopping of the sentence for a few days, the count. And now we understand this. Let me just make this clear because this is very important. This will determine what the um, uh, public role and resources are for our country for the next 10 years and who we are and what our needs are. And you have to know the demographics and you have to know the number. The quality and the quantity, the richness of our diversity which they don't want to know. Sad to say, this president. So there is a law that says that by the end of December, uh, the president makes the, makes the um, uh, determination as to the numbers. And that's what re everything acts upon. When that law was passed, they had no idea of the coronavirus and that the, all of the uh, delay that would occur with that. Four, Former heads of the census have said, have said, this can't be an accurate count unless you go until November, excuse me, April. Between April 1st and April 30th, the president should be, have that time to make sure the count is accurate. And that's what you act upon. 
They insist on doing it by December 31st. With this president making a judgment as to whether citizens or uh, non-citizens undocumented in any way are in the count. That's not what the constitution says, the people. That's not what our founders had in mind, the people. Not whoever you feel like, including in the count. But this isn't just from here to there. There is no way we can. And so in this bill, we're saying to them, you've got to enable this to go to April. That would just be the fair thing to do. This is no gift to anybody. It's honoring the Constitution. We have no give on the census. This is appalling. This isn't partisan or anything. This is patriotism. So in any event, that's one of, another one of the fights we're having. So again, in terms of the lives, the livelihood, and the life of our democracy, we come at it from a completely different direction. Do we want to find common ground? Absolutely. Do we want to hold everybody hostage for the future in terms of, of our heroes, the virus, and the rest in order to make uh, a payment earlier than we could if we just said, never mind the rest. Let us ossify, let us solidify, let us perpetuate all the, the uh, disrespect for the, uh, our, uh, our communities of color and all the rest when it comes to their health, their job, and the rest. That takes me then to the last subject, our children. Our children, our children, our children. Their, their health, their education, the economic security of their families, all harmed by what the Republicans are doing, okay? So in the education piece, when we did Heroes five months ago today, we had like $105 billion with the anticipation that they would embrace some kind of a national strategy and this thing would be ebbing, not flowing this place. Um, we need more. Now we need like 250. They are just not budging on their number, which is 150, but it's not a question. And this applies to the whole bill of the amount of the money only. It is how it is spent. And we cannot let how it is spent reinforce the diversities. Excuse me one second. Could you, could you sound, I have a, a light shining with me. Divine inspiration, I hope, but nonetheless. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the children, I know Father will talk about higher education as well, but how they originally put out their money would, again, unless you're actually in school, you're not getting money. Well, the, 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 that can't be because everybody can't actually be in school. So at least they've reviewed and, uh, and understood that there are many, many kids who are not in school, who are not uh, actually, or who are, are virtual or hybrid. And that takes money to make sure that all of those kids have what they need in order to do it. If you don't, who's going to pay the price? The children in the schools in the most economically, the Title I kids. So again, this is, you know, it's, it's, I know it's a lot and I spent all this time explaining it to you because when people say, just take the deal, it's like, first of all, there is no deal. They can't even pass any, you know, very little in the Senate. They have a $500 billion bill and, and largely on the business side, not on the other side. And we wanna, we wanna support small business. We wanna do all those things. But we cannot say to working families in America, just because you're gonna get a check and we want you to get it, we're gonna do all these other things to ossify the injustices in our community. This is, this is a real opportunity because it will have lasting results. Having said that, I say to everyone, help is on the way. We want it to be safer. We want it to be bigger, more, and we want it to be soon and it will be retroactive. It will be retroactive. So think in those terms, not like I've got to have this right now. I don't care about the rest of it. I don't care about the rest of it because it's food on the table, it's help with rent, it's respect for our workers and, and uh, earned income tax credit and all of that kind of thing. Let me just say one, one last thing that is a major obstacle and that is safety in the workplace. That is not for us a provision in the bill. It is a value in our country that we send our people to work. We are not asking to risk their lives. 
And this pandemic, you would think there'd be a heightened reality of that. But Mitch McConnell has a bill, liability immunity. So I'm an essential worker, you're an essential worker. We have to go to work, because if we don't go to work, we do not get unemployment insurance. Got that? And when we go to work, if we get sick, our employer, because they haven't taken the precautions or just to get sick, you have no recourse. You have no recourse. Then you have to go home because you can't go to work because you're infected and you bring that home to your family. So that's, that's what, what century are we living in, much less what country are we living in? So we're saying, you know, let's, and we're exchanging language over on a strong OSHA provision. And so that's a good conversation. However, it doesn't work if you have an overarching McConnell language that says there'll be uh, this, um, uh, under this provision, no other, none of the other regulations go into effect. So it just, to use a word I don't like to use, it trumps uh, of that. So anyway, it's, it's complicated. It's an opportunity. And we did not, our, ours is scientifically, academically, institutionally based the numbers. I mean, it's not, this is what we feel like. There's, oh, they're spending so much money. No, we're meeting the needs of the American people. So that's the, the fight we're in. We have to find our common ground. We've been working very hard to do that. As the secretary and I say to each other, if we weren't both determined to have an agreement, we probably wouldn't be talking to each other because we don't have any common values uh, to continue. Uh, but he and I have had many uh, um, agreements on the COVID. We had four bipartisan bills. We had uh, we, appropriations bills we always uh, able to uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat, but I'm not sure there's a rabbit in this hat unless they understand that we're starting at the American fam the kitchen table of America's working families. So uh, again, uh, prayerfully, respectfully for, of the dignity of every person, the dignity of work, our responsibility to our children are honoring our heroes, are crushing the virus and putting money in the pockets of the American people in a way that is sustainable into the future as well as protecting the life of our democracy. There's just some thoughts I wanted to share with you this morning. I thought I was just coming by to say hi, good luck <laughs> with what you're doing and just be careful with you for the morning. I did not know that I was going to go into all of that. So forgive me for being warm. But uh, that's what that's what it is. So I'm pleased to take any questions you might have about it. Madam Speaker, I can't help but believe that that light that shone on you was providence and perhaps a metaphor. Uh, thank you for enlightening us. As, as you know, our, uh, our religious community in San Francisco is very diverse. Uh, in addition to the houses of worship, we also have academic and healthcare institutions. Uh, as well as the, our faith-based social service agencies and others. And what we've tried to do today is invite three faith panelists from different sectors uh, to just give a very brief update on how they've been impacted, but more importantly, to ask a question of you. And let us begin with Father Paul Fitzgerald, the uh, president of the University of San Francisco, a, a, a deep supporter and friend and colleague of this council. Father Paul. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, uh, Speaker Pelosi. Uh, for joining us today. And thank you for your recent uh, words of inspiration at our university convocation uh, a month ago. Uh, very inspiring and, and very um, uplifting for our, for our whole community. Mm -hmm. um, last March, like all universities, USF pivoted uh, to emergency remote instruction. Um, we chose to remain remote in the summer, and then we made the difficult choice, but I think the right choice, not to bring our students back to campus in the fall. Uh, dormitories are like cruise ships on land. And as much as young people promise that they'll wear masks and socially distant, distance, they don't have the executive functions yet at the age of 18 and 19 mm -hmm. to do so. So, so we uh, have recently announced that we're going to be remote in the spring as well. And that's, you know, put a big uh, hit in our budget. 
but we have to put people above above money right now. Um, it's a it's a huge time of stress uh, for all of our students, staff, and faculty. Um, and so even remotely, our students are accessing counseling and psychological services in record numbers. Um, there's more than double the participation in career services. I think parents are really you know, wanting their children, their students to be prepared to enter a very, very competitive, very difficult job market when they finish their degrees. Um, our international students, some of them were fortunate enough to, to have been in the United States and are staying here in the city. Uh, but others, you know, were forced to go home, and now they're trying to do remote uh, learning from Singapore or from Kenya, and and it's the time time differences are are just very very difficult. Um, and then some of our we have 217 students living on campus in emergency um, housing because they're Pell Grant eligible, and this is the safest and best place for them to be, uh, so they don't you know, live in a very small space with three generations of, of people. Um, and then students are, are coming to campus to our food pantry uh, because they have, they're, they're experiencing food insecurity. So the, the, um, the CARES uh, funding, we, we received $7.2 million, which we passed directly to our students, um, half, you know, in the form of uh, uh, refunds for their housing last spring and then half in just direct assistance. And then our trustees um, raised a million dollars among themselves for our DACA students. So students who didn't qualify for the federal money uh, were able to get that same level of support, which is really tailored to each student. Uh, more than 400 of our returning students um, needed additional financial aid. So we, we gave them that additional uh, institution-based aid. Um, and our faculty and, and staff took reductions in compensation uh, in order for us to close our, our budget gap. So it's been a time of, of, of our community coming together uh, around our shared values. Uh, I am very concerned. Uh, we had about 400 students decide not to continue their, their bachelor's degree. And nationally, I think it's something like 15% of students who step away from their degrees return and finish their degrees. So just as we saw in 2008, um, you know, that generation for the rest of their professional careers are going to carry a burden, a financial burden. Um, so we, we're trying very hard to re-engage our students and get them to, to, to enroll in, in the spring semester. So my, my, my question to you is, um, thank you for everything you're doing. And do you see the possibility of, in this legislation, uh, support for private, non, not-for-profit uh, higher education? Uh, legislation signed by this or a future occupant of the White House. Yes, I do, Father. Thank you so much for your leadership and uh, with much gratitude to the administration and faculty of uh, USF as well as uh, uh, to the, uh, the student body for their the courage uh, that imagine being that young and having to face some of those issues uh, sometimes in homes that are not as uh, financially able to be as financially supportive and even though uh, the, their presence is not at school. Yeah, and HEROES Act has 38, almost $39 billion uh, for higher education, including uh, billions for private nonprofit province, which is much more than the Senate bill. Even in their small little bill, they did address some of these things. Ours is much more than that. But it, it, um, it, it expands, extends and expands um, suspension of federal student loan payments and interest accrual for millions of students. It also helps ensure students do not lose, need, lose SNAP because they get a federal benefit. This is, as you discussed, really important. Uh, they get some income from work study or federal student loan aid that they don't lose their eligibility for SNAP. Uh, it prevents the administration from imposing restrictions on students who receive emergency financing, financial relief under the CARES Act and the HEROES Act. So you have some ideas that we don't like. And improves the public service loan forgiveness, including for California doctors. We have something, California, Texas have something in common and we're working in a bipartisan way uh, to address that, uh, the education of doctors for our two states for some reason. There's an anomaly of what, in our two states about how we can receive those federal funds. 
Uh, this is part of the discussion we're having on education. Uh, we think the figure that they have is too low when we talk about K through 12. And uh, what's so sad about it is that nothing brings more money to the treasury than education, whether it's K through 12, higher ed, post-grad, lifetime money, lifetime money for our workers. And, and uh, so this is all an investment. It's all an investment and we're having a discussion over that amount of money while they're giving tax breaks to the richest people in the country. So it, it is, um, uh, but it, it's, again, it's about the children, it's about the future. And thank you for the accommodations that you are making for those who have who better to be in your setting. And that's a challenge I know uh, than into uh, situations where uh, the quarters are not big enough really for people to separate in their, in their own homes. So this is, this is, we're still waiting. One of the things we're waiting for them back is their, how they would spend their allocation of the money because it's always about the language. It's not about money, it's about funding. Yeah, you get my point. And so uh, we're like, the American people are worth it. Our children are worth it. Our future requires it. So let's stay in touch because obviously you've touched on a number of things. I will say that I, I thank you for many things, one of which was the outcry on the visas for students coming from abroad. I mean, that was like, what? I mean, many of the things that they do, I think are acts of cruelty. But when you combine cruelty and stupidity, it's like, what are they thinking? Thinking. I use the term loosely. Forgive thank me for my excuse. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. Um, another sector, and since the Great Recession, the San Francisco Interfaith Council has been convening the CEOs of the faith based social service agencies who provide basically the safety net for our city's most vulnerable residents. We've invited Dr. Anita Friedman, the Executive Director of Jewish Family Children's Services, to represent that sector today because she is, uh, her, her organization is representing some of the most vulnerable COVID uh, victims, those in the senior citizen category and others. Uh, uh, Dr. Friedman, uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And Madam Speaker, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, I've worked with you and uh, with your wonderful staff for decades. Yes. And uh, it lifts our spirits to know that you're on the front lines fighting for us. We have so much confidence in you. And uh, under these difficult times, we are especially grateful to you for everything you're doing that benefits all of us. Thank you, Anita. Uh, a few quick points. The need, uh, you, you mentioned the need. The, the need is extraordinary at this point. The numbers of people who are coming for help because they're having issues with their children or their teenagers or they're elderly and they're alone or they need food or they need financial aid Mm -hmm. or they are anxious and depressed is, is uh, unprecedented in, in my lifetime. And I've been doing this for more than 45 years. Mm -hmm. And I think you know that. Um, and that's quite extraordinary. And this, we see this as an important opportunity for the public sector and the private sector to work together on behalf of our people. And I know that's your philosophy as well. And uh, we are very proud of our community. I think our, our community has a reputation for being one of the best places on earth for good reason. Uh, and so uh, a little bit of good news is that the number of people who are volunteering to help, to deliver food, to reach out to people, to call old people, to transport people, to tutor children uh, who are trying to desperately learn how to do distance learning is really extraordinary. And that's for all the communities, uh, hundreds of young people, millennials, who never volunteered before arrived to the occasion. Our government officials are doing extraordinary work to lead us. And this interfaith council and our ability to work together as various communities is really a source of our great strength. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question, but before I do that, uh, in addition to the concerns that we have about the numbers of people who need help at this difficult time, we're also seeing, as you know, an increase in hate the uh, amount of hate, discrimination, racism, anti-Semitism is of deep concern. I come to work sometimes and I find a swastika on my office door because it says Jewish Family and Children's Services. In Marin County, they've asked us to come in. Uh, we have a Holocaust Center, as you know, that teaches 
about hate and discrimination. They've asked us to come in to do education for the entire public school system. Same thing in San Mateo because of the amount of anti-Semitism in the high schools. This is of deep concern, and I know you're aware of it, but it's something that we're addressing here in this community. And again, this Interfaith Council brings us together to deal with, uh, with our community and uh, our governor has been also a great leader. My big concern is in the long term. We have short-term issues, but my big concern is what's gonna happen to the people who are not able to re-enter the workforce? What can you advocate for in your thinking and in your advocacy for funding that will address the needs of the people who have lost their jobs and will have great difficulty re-entering the workforce now or in the future? I appreciate it, Anita, your wonderful work for generations and uh, uh, thank you. It's hard to believe you've been doing it that long. It agrees with you. The, uh, I thank the Jewish Family and Children's Services for what you do. And as, what, as Michael referenced, uh, the collaboration among so many other groups for those uh, shared values and what we have to do there. So I do, uh, I do wanna address specifically some of your questions about the workforce, but I, I wanna begin with how you ended on the discrimination issue. Uh, this, um, we had a bill on the floor about uh, ending discrimination, but Asian American community is taking a particular hit across the country. It's, it's stunning the things that people think it's okay to say to other people and in front of their children. I don't, I mean, I could go on and on as I'm sure all of you can. And uh, so we had a bill on the floor to heighten awareness about how long this was and we shouldn't be doing it. And um, our Republicans opposed it. Some of them, many of them opposed it and said that I was wasting Congress's time by bringing such a bill to the floor. It's a waste of time. So you see what we're up against. See what we're up against. Uh, the, um, and we just have to, look, let me, let me divert for just a few seconds from the beautiful auspices under which we are. The antidote to all of the poison is the vote. The antidote is the vote. No matter what you talk about here, it's the vote. It's about vote your health, vote yourself. It doesn't have to be this way. This president broke ground and he left it broken. And we are going to repair that. We're going to build back better. But understand with all of the, this is almost a lounge act, what we're talking about with this bill, compared to the big arena, which is the election. And all the things that you name, the antidote to those ills is the vote. Because we have a different set of values, a different starting, <clears throat> not trickle down from the wealthiest, but bubble up, bubble up from our families, our kitchen table and the rest of that. And, and again, the uh, license that was given to people that it would be okay, USA, at his rallies. He never said anything about that. Charlottesville, they're good people on both sides. White supremacist refused to, to condemn white supremacist. 2020, who would have ever thought a president of the United States would not welcome the opportunity to condemn supremacists? And I myself have been the victim of so many of specific groups of theirs just with their hate and their violence and the rest. It's scary, but it's not, it cannot continue. But understand it was there. He didn't create it but he made it fester and he gave it, he gave it credibility. So anyway, let me get back to what we're doing in the bill. Our Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act initiatives that are in the bill. It's $485 million for adult job, job training, half a billion dollars almost, focused on those economically affected by COVID. 518 million for youth training initiatives. Those who lost their jobs and then youth training initiatives. 597, almost $600 million for dislocated worker employment and training, helping state and workforce facing large unexpected layoffs because uh, of COVID. 
And then we have 25 million for migrant and seasonal workers and a half a billion dollars for services to connect people of all backgrounds to jobs. A recognition of this disruption and money, and money takes money uh, to, uh, to help. On unemployment insurance, we have a, a strong a fund. It, it, it's all not as simple as it sounds. Unemployed and do, help, what's the amount of the, of the um, enhanced benefit? Is it 400 and 600? That discussion. But there are also 5 million, about 5 million workers risk of, at risk of exhausting all of their unemployment insurance um, before January 31st. And um, our, our proposal is stronger in terms of helping them. So that, that UI is, uh, that, that addresses some of those folks in a uh, more complicated way than you might think. So that is, I mean, that, that is the heart of the matter. But you know, as we're doing that, we have to recognize we've had our disparities in our community. We've had uh, the injustices and the rest before this. This exacerbates it to, the, to such an extent, but all of it, remember this, all of it is an investment. All of it is stimulus. Nothing brings more money to the treasury than education, including lifetime learning. Money in the pockets of the American people, whether it's unemployment insurance and uh, uh, direct payments is a stimulus. It's all a stimulus. Money to the state and local government is a stimulus. The CARES Act saved the economy because it was a, a stimulus and now we need to do more. It didn't start out that way. It started as trickle down. We came in and turned it upside down and made it bubble up. But it, that's what some of these debates are about. And then just one last point on that in terms of, of the stimulus and the rest. It is, um, again, it's how the money is spent, what the values are. Show me your budget, I'll show you your values. That's just what this is about. So thank you, thank you, Anita. Thank you and to the Jewish Family and Children's Services. For what you thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you, Anita. Th those were important questions. Um, Hala Hijazi wears a number of hats. Uh, one of them, she is a member of our board. She is the Muslim representative uh, of our board and is probably the best network Muslim that I know in the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, she also serves on the San Francisco Human Rights Commission and I know is devoted and dedicated to the issue of food security. Hala, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Kashyyyk. Um, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, um, Speaker Pelosi, thank you so much for your leadership, your sacrifices, everything that you're doing um, to protect the lives of livelihoods of all Americans, not just us here in San Francisco. Uh, thank you to the unwavering faith of our brothers and sisters in the faith-based communities who are feeding the hungry, housing the unhoused, and comforting those in need as we collectively confront sick circumstances that challenge both our humanity and morality. Um, before I ask the question, I just want to make some comments and also because this is an interfaith council, want to, um, and especially because of these difficult times, want to share some comforting words by the Quran and Hadith. None of you has faith until he loves for his brother or his neighbor what he loves for himself and hates for his brother what he hates for himself. The believers in their mutual kindness, compassion, and sympathy are just like one body. When one of the limbs suffers, the whole body responds to it with wakefulness and fever. And when asked what Islamic traits are the best, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, feed the people. And greet those whom you know and those you don't know. So today, we are all awake and with fever. Um, as one body. And what I want to talk about today before I ask the question is as someone who's lived in San Francisco since, I don't know, since 1997, but in the Bay Area for 81, I have never seen um, such uh, despair, such low morale. I have never seen such long lines at food banks. 
um, I'd never seen not just the unhoused or the low income or the, you know, these are, these are doctors, lawyers, children, teachers, uh, students, and they're white, black, Asian. It's not just our vulnerable or underrepresented population. It's everyone standing in very, very, very long food lines across the San Francisco and probably the Bay Area. What, um, what are we gonna be doing about that? So before I ask that question, um, there's the fear, uh, one, there's fear of even leaving, especially in um, populated areas and neighborhoods, densely populated, like Chinatown and the Tenderloin and certain places in the mission. There's fear because of the anti-Asian uh, hate crimes, rise in hate crimes and assaults and harassments. There's fear because of some of our streets and how they're impacted in the Tenderloin because of the drug activity, because of the rise of homelessness. There are so many fears. And so what are we going to be doing about that? So my question to you is, uh, Speaker Pelosi, is as we're dealing with two pandemics, COVID-19 and systemic racism, our brothers and sisters are concerned about the increase in the number of unhoused, providing access to nutritional and culturally appropriate food to unprecedented number of food insecure, and in the increase in white supremacist activities, resulting in an increase in hate crimes on the streets and at our places of worship. What more can be done by our local and federal government and business community to address these concerns? Thank you, Hala, for your comments, for your question, for your leadership, and for your values that you presented so beautifully. Uh, it is, uh, when, my, when I talk to my own children about this, they say, mom, don't talk about anything other than the fact that people are hungry in America. That is the message that is fraught with all kinds of other meaning. Why are they hungry? Why, why, how did they become hungry? Why are they still hungry? So when we did our original act bill, we had tens of billions of dollars in the HEROES Act for food, addressing food insecurity in our country. Do you know what? Mitch McConnell had in his bill, $248,000. Tens of billions, $248,000. So now um, we have, again, uh, millions of billions of dollars with SNAP and child nutrition and the CR. Now, when we did the continuing resolution a few weeks ago uh, to keep government open, we had to do that by September 30th, they wanted to put it was supposed to be a clean, what we call a clean CR. Nothing in it except a continuation. That's why it's called a continuing resolution, a continuation of the funding from the year before until we could come to terms with how we go forward. So it just buys time. In the continuing resolution though, they said, we want it clean. We said, we want it clean. Let's just do it. Uh, they said, oh, we want $30 billion for farmers. Well, so that's not a clean resolution. So we want $30 billion, and for what purpose? You know, we, we all want to support our farmers and the rest. I don't want to even go into the politics of this, but we want $30 billion for our farmers. And it was, it was a slush fund. Again, there are a lot of slush funds in, this, in their proposals. That's why we want prescriptions for how the money should be spent. That's part of the debate. But anyway, getting back to that, because they wanted that so desperately, we saw it as an opportunity. And we were able to get $8 billion in food in the continuing resolution earlier than this resolution of, of the bills that we're doing right now. And that was, that was a big victory. We had the emergency pandemic um, money for schools. But one of the, um, one of the hang ups, which took hours to resolve in the course of the day, and we had to have the Congressional Budget Office and everybody else weigh in, was when we're doing the food for the schools, they didn't want it to apply to childcare centers. And it was like, well, we're talking about children being hungry. What is your problem with that? Well, it might cost more money. And so, so what? Uh, you know, th this is the amount of money and it will be spent. And, and it took a lot of time to get them to do that. We had to prove that it wasn't going to cost more money that would be within that allocation. And, um, and it was typical of what they thought of childcare. We, we are having a hard time getting them to support more childcare funding because 
You can't go to work because your child can't go to school. You need child care fund. It is the most transformative piece of, of so much of it in our daily lives before pandemic, but more so now. And they're saying, you, 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 you're asking for too much. So we've had that, shall we say, child care uh, discussion in many uh, uh, manifestations of, of what we should be doing. So in any event, the HEROES contained 15 billion for, uh, for assistance. We did get eight in the CR uh, for 14, 17, the latest figure we have is 17,000, excuse me, 17 million children in America food insecure. Is that a statement of our values that we have a budget that does not recognize that we have to do everything in our power to address the children as well as their families? Millions of their same families are housing insecure and on the verge of addiction. We don't know how that would work. So again, it's, I keep saying, is it the price or is it the money? The price would be whatever we need to meet the needs of the American people. And you just don't want to spend the money? Is that our discussion? Or you just don't care about what, the, uh, what it is? So again, um, the, the people are hungry for a lot of reasons. And a lot of it is economic insecurity as well as just the injustice of it all. But I thank you for focusing on that because it is um, indicative of, of, uh, of uh, exploitation of workers, not paying a, a living wage, uh, you know, all of the other things that we've all been fighting for. And when we talk about a family of four, both parents working, getting the minimum wage, cannot put food on the table. And that's why we have to have more wages and less exploitation of workers because it's all, it's all connected. In terms of the, um, we were very pleased, not happy because we didn't want it to be necessary, but we passed the No Ban Act in July, the first Muslim civil rights bill in our history, which repeals Trump's Muslim ban and prevents future bans. Of course, the Senate has not taken that up. But when I talked earlier about the Asian American community being impacted by this poison in the air, the Muslim American community pays a big price on that. And we're very proud of Muslims in Congress who are uh, really an inspiration, also a source of uh, uh, intellectual resource to us on that. We pass a never again Holocaust education to combat anti-Semitism. And they're like, why are you doing that? You know, because we, because that's who we are. That defines us, it's our values. And again, we have to just uh, shout out the bit because you came back to the bigotry where Anita ended up with her uh, comments as well. And we also passed the George Floyd Policing uh, uh, and, um, Act and George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which we think is really important for us to come together uh, as, as a community. But nobody knows that better than, each, than all of you about coming together as, as a community. And it is sad that when this is such a desperate time that there is, they laugh at the need to crush the virus, call it a hoax, it's gonna happen, this or that. Uh, we're hoping for a vaccine, hope and pray for a vaccine. You know, when I say hope and pray, they say to me, faith or science? I said, no, no. Science is an answer to our prayers. These are not two separate things. This is God's gift to us to have these uh, solutions. So I, I would encourage people, if in fact we get a vaccine that is scientifically uh, approved a, a, in the proper way, not rushed because of politics, uh, that that is something that we should accept and not say, well, it happened on Trump's watch, so I'm not doing it. No, we have to do it because we're not gonna get rid of this virus unless we vaccinate, vaccinate against it, but also prevent it from, from happening. And that is again, one of the core differences. Now I'm gonna see their language later today because the word in the press is that they've accepted our texting language, but in the people that we see, we haven't seen evidence of that yet. And that will be a very central thing. And that language very heavy. Barbara Lee, from, as you know, Barbara, she 
uh, even improve the language we had in the HEROES Act in light of the, excess, uh, the intensity of the, the virus in the minority communities uh, since five months ago today. So their language is even better that they reject it. Now they say they're accepting it. We'll see. And I, I can't, I can't. It's only what they said in the press. In the press, the president said, what, night before last, go big or go home. And then they said, well, he didn't really mean that. Now this morning, he's saying, I want an even bigger bill than, than the rest of us want. So he goes from canceling the, uh, the um, negotiations to go big, to I didn't mean it, to go big, because he sees um, his numbers go down in the polls. He only cares really two things. Where's the market? And by the way, billions, trillions of dollars have been spent to bolster the market. I'm not complaining about that. That's an important indicator, but it's the credit systems, all the rest that the Fed has done to bolster the market. Okay, let's spend trillions of dollars to bolster America's working families. By the way, a consumer economy, people have money in their pockets, they spend, they inject demand into the economy, they create jobs, it's a stimulus. So not only is this from compassion and respect for the dignity and worth of every person, it's a pragmatic thing to, to in other words, to help um, strengthen our, our economy. So I think I thank you. I mean, it, it's tough because everybody says, well, people are hungry. They, people need this check. And I say, I, I understand that, but they cannot, we cannot allow them to use that urgency to ossify injustice and disrespect and the public policy that we put out there that will have an impact. But forget the antidote is the vote. Antidote vote. Vote your health. Vote your health. So anyway, as always, I feel like this is a family conversation with all of it. Uh, Kusek, thank you so much for, for your leadership again and again. Thank you, Michael, for yours. Girlfriend, girlfriend, Rita Semmel, love you, darling. Thank you, Father. Thank you, uh, Anita. Thank you, Holly, for your, and thank you, Mark, for your beautiful comments. Um, I know we're going to get some inspiration uh, from, uh, from Michael now, so I yield back. Speaker Pelosi, you have been most generous with the gift of time today, and it's it said that uh, in moments of crisis, people define themselves. We are so grateful for your leadership know that you have our collective prayers, not only for you, but for your beautiful family and continue to lean on us and ask our support as, as you continue to journey on this road, not only be, on behalf of the citizens of the city and county of San Francisco, but of the nation. We love you greatly and we thank you for your leadership and, uh, please know that uh, the San Francisco Interfaith Council is appreciative of our very special relationship and we are here for you. Thank you. That concludes our program this week. We ask you to join us next week when we welcome Dr. Grant Colfax, the director of the Department of Public Health, who will join us. Thank God you. bless you all and God keep you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. Thank you, Thank you Madam Speaker. Thank you. Stay safe. So faith panelists, you're welcome to stay behind for our debrief and of course the JIC team, we will debrief following this program.